In 1970, I guess before that, for about four years, I uh, spent much of my time in Dr. Steinberg's office, but then I was privileged to have his residency. And um, he always said that podiatry was closed chain medicine. It's the, it's, it's the foot that contacts the ground. It's the foot that's weighted, that accepts gravity, that accepts a shoe box. It's a very special place that deserves a specialist. And, and that's, that's who we are. So closed chain medicine is the study of people weighted and in function. The forces are gravity, the hard and yielding shoe boxes, hard and yielding ground surface, and underlying biomechanical pathology. Secondary forces being weight, age, activity level, health state. So if you weigh 400 pounds and you're diabetic, you're gonna walk the earth differently than if you were, I don't know what, a marathon runner and and uh, 172 pounds. I love, I beat anorexia, I love that one. That's, that's great. So open versus closed chain medicine, this sums it up for me. Steinberg gave me these slides 40 years ago. And anybody have any idea wh what these are, what we have here? There's two separate lesions. One is above the level of the skin. The other one is driven down into the skin. Uh, it's, 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 this is top and this is, this is bottom. So we have this massive lesion, uh, pretty similar. If I looked at this lesion alone as a dermatologist or a derm path and I said it was from the stomach lining, this would come out to have um, my, mitochondrial cells and mitosis and extracellularity and would be a somewhat ominous lesion. Okay, so one is Verruca vulgaris and the other one is Verruca plantaris. And this is closed chain medicine. Every step you take, every cell, every tissue, every, every muscle system, every tendon system is being impacted by the ground and, and this is turning into this. And we own that. This is what we own. The doctors don't understand, the patients, the insurance companies. Nobody understands it except for us. So this is, this is kind of what we're talking about, what I'm trying to reclaim, that way back when Root gave us a shot at it, and we, as far as I'm concerned, we blew the shot. But we're going to try and have another one. So we're talking about position and function. A lot of the biomechanists are talking strictly about function. They can take an orthotic shell of any position, and add orthotic reactive forces to it, modifications, posts, cutouts, that will take away symptomatology. Uh, you cannot be treated until you have a problem. What is your problem, uh, plantar fasciitis? Uh, my son is nine years old. He has the same biomechanical type at me, as me. My mom had plantar fasciitis. Uh, will you take care of my son? Well, not really, because I'll take care of your son when he comes to me with plantar fasciitis. I say to my patients, if I could make you walk at 80 the way you walked at 40, would you pay me $1,000? Uh, I say it facetiously, but deep down inside, I don't think there's a patient that wouldn't, wouldn't invest in that. Um, walking is weight reducing, it's all those good things, and I'm talking about functional life expectancy. In other words, to me, we have a physiological age. I have 20-year-old people who can't I don't know what, can't walk 10 steps, and 80-year-old people that can swim the English Channel. So there's a functional life expectancy, and every time you have, you're overweight, you're diabetic, you're uh, unfit, you're unexercised, you're reducing your functional life expectancy. Uh, most of my patients say, things were great until I was 86, and then for the last two years, it's been hell. And, and for some people, that's 45, and that's 35 or 55, but we all have a functional life expectancy. And Emerson said, I measure your health by the number of shoes you've worn out, and I think that's, that's a real good gauge. Um, so we're talking mostly about architecture. Uh, I think biomechanics has focused in language, in language, on physics and engineering and mechanical terms. Dorsiflectory stiffness, momentary forces. Uh, we don't obviate the need for physics, engineering, and mechanics in our work, but I use architecture to explain it to 
you and the doctors and patients because we understand that better. It's not as confusing. So we have an architectural truss that is connected by a flexible tie beam and that's, that's what the foot is about, okay? If the tie beam stretches, the truss collapses and it could collapse on one side or the other. So you're talking insertional calcaneal and plantar plate injuries. I'm in practice 40 years, I, uh, whoever uh, is here. Only about 10 years ago I started hearing the word plantar plate. I, I really never heard it before. Now we're doing sophisticated um, you know, microscopic surgeries on plantar plate injuries, but we've always focused on the insertional calcaneal problems of the plantar fascia uh, and not the, the distal problems. I think now we're starting to understand that that's just as important. So when the tie beam removes, tissue stress increases, and I'll, and I'll add the word cellular stress, cellular stress. On a microscopic level, our capillaries, our nerves, our, our connective tissue is all being stressed in an enclosed chain. Um, and you have a choice of either stretching, cutting, lengthening, compensating, or weakening or shoring up, supporting, and decompensate. What I'm saying is, if you have a system like this and the patient has insertional plantar fasciitis, standard treatments, night stretching, you know, one of these gadgets. You're creating a weaker system, that person will never walk and have the same potential of living a functional life as before that. We have EPFs. Uh, we cut the plantar fascia in order to eliminate calcaneal pain but we're gifting that patient with a lesser lifespan uh, in terms of function. Uh, TALs uh, for ulcers, I do a TAL, remove the forefoot pressure, and I don't know what you would do or I would do on half of a, of a, of a TAL, you know, in other words, half of a tendo Achilles, but basically we're talking about changing your life in a negative way. So we're looking to shore up, support, decompensate, and strengthen wherever we can. Um, is there inherited biomechanical pathology and is inherited biomecha bi biomechanical pathology the same for all feet? And this is where six years ago I applied for patents for a foot typing method and, and one of the reasons that this is the, uh, actually the second conference of its kind um, is that we, we now have a foot typing method to type feet into common groups and treat those feet differently. And I guess I would say my incentive was that the only ones that are allowed to use this patented method are podiatrists as a profession. There might be some chiropractor who has tremendous training and they could work with it, but every podiatrist has, well, let's see if we go through it. Um, so inherited biomechanical pathology alters the ground reactive force contact it changes if you have a hypermobile first your weight is shifted to the second um, changes in proprioception reduced muscle uh, engine tone loss of optimal functional position and muscle atrophy and disuse um, tissue stress increases as the truss collapses and we're back with that again so here here's a leveraged position, a leveraged position, thinking in terms of pose for yoga, uh, thinking in terms of um, mass position. I don't know if you're familiar with Ed Glazer's uh, biomechanics, but it's a positional type of mechanics. And we have been locked in subtalar joint neutral position for 40 years, and more and more of the literature is proving that it's uh, basically not the, not the best position for anybody to function in or most people to function in. This is poorly leveraged and these are the muscles that, that this is supposed to allow torque, leverage and function that is not happening in this case. So a centered foot leverages and the muscle engines uh, can be trained. We're talking about boot camp. We're talking about uh, muscle engine training of some kind that we should be instituting with our patients or uniting with physical therapists to form an alliance between me putting the patient in a proper position and their work becoming more effective. 
Uh, I've developed relationships with physical therapists that are uncommon in podiatry because they're referring me patients for my inserts so that the patient can go back and their work can be more effective. So undeniably the foot's the foundation of the posture and any change in foot structure will change it. Any change in foot function will change the posture and the foot is the location for controlling um, the posture. So this is what happens when the foot is out of, out of kilter and we're talking about this area, we're not really talking about the digits, we're talking about this area which forms an architectural truss. So any collapse will cause postural problems, compensatory. Uh, if, if I take the foot and I plan to flex it, if I fire tendo Achilles, I'm successfully taking the first ray rocker down to the ground and allowing it to work, but I'm also taking the other four metatarsal rockers down onto the ground. That causes secondary reaction of extensor digitorum longus, which leads to hammer toes. So if I have a primary muscle, a perineus longus, that's only job is to lower the first metatarsal and it fatigues, it can no longer do its job, then I have to compensate the tendo Achilles and my point is that what happens then is I give a tendo Achilles stretching program and iliotibial band goes so I stretch out the iliotibial band and then the abductors of the hip and the, and the glutes go and we're now caught up in a negative chain rather than teaching perineus to do its primary job and eliminating the need for compensation that never calls upon these pathologies to exist the vault of the foot. Uh, the medial longitudinal and lateral longitudinal arches are connected by a roof and in architecture when two arches are connected by a roof that's called a vault. So we're basically talking about the area that we want to fill up with our devices under here and right now we're basically filling up the medial longitudinal arch. And so vaulting is becoming uh, again there are three or four different new biomechanical paradigms that talk about vaulting and filling up that vault with material to gain an optimal functional position and make the muscles trainable. So it's the hollow of the under the foot and not the sides that are important and when the vault of the foot collapses it widens, lengthens and lowers. Okay, if we've functionally foot typed a person, in other words if we've given uh, a typing to measure a thousand people and they ended up in five different categories of foot types I can now use a biomechanical timeline before, during or after symptomatology to uh, uh, give them biomechanical cures. So I'm making a biomechanical I'm diagnosing a chief complaint I don't want that misunderstood and I'm not changing my therapy at all but I'm diagnosing a biomechanical pathology that I can now cure. It's birth until death. There are precursors and predictors. There are some words that I want you to try and sort of think about when you're practicing. One is precursor, the other one is predictor. And um, what I'm saying there is that if somebody has a collapsed flat foot, they're going to end up with a potential hammer toe. The collapsed flat foot is a precursor of what might happen and it's a, a predictor of whether or not they're going to have problems in the future. If I now foot type a person, for instance, if they have a, oh, a rigid forefoot, in other words, their first metatarsal is rigidly down on the ground and can't move, that's a precursor for a first metatarsal callus in my book, okay? If they have a hypermobile first, if they have what we call a flexible forefoot, that first ray is lifting up off the ground and it's predictable that they're going to get calluses under the second med and the IP hallux because that's where their weight is going to go. So whether they're 10 years old or 80 years old, that precursor exists once I type the patient. So then we could make decisions on when to pose and prop the foot into optimal functional position and when to train that foot. Do any of you know the name Dr. Major Munson? Does that name ring a bell at all? I've never lectured to a podiatrist uh, until, I'm going to say until, if they've never seen me lecture, who knew who this gentleman was. In 1912, we were in World War I, and the army was, uh, was 
wanting to win the war and they hired Major Munson. He was an army orthopedic surgeon. He developed the Munson shoe last, which 11 million of our soldiers have held. Uh, he uh, formed a training pattern called flat foot camps, which today are called boot camps. He realized that there were feet that wouldn't succeed in being trained, and so everybody knows you can't get into the army with flat feet. Uh, and he made a shoe that was more foot-shaped, um, and we won the war. So Munson's work has been more or less forgotten, but I'm kind of excited because next year's 2012, and, uh, and I'm personally going to be promoting the centennial of, of his work. So that's the undercurrent of our biomechanics. So we have juvenile tie beam fault. This is a, a biomechanical foot type where either the front or back of the tie beam is flexible too early. So in addition to normal growth, you're having something pathological occur. Juvenile bunions are an example of what happens in the, the juvenile tie beam expansion. An adult tie beam fault uh, if you're 20 years old and bone growth stops, let's say you're 18 years old and bone growth stops, uh, and now you're a seven, and now you're 50 years old and you're a size nine, I ask you, what's that called? In other words, is that growth? That's not growth, it's something pathologic. It's something that we don't define and, and, and work with. And I've left it out, but Munson said, he could have drafted you at 18 or 16 or 40 or 50. He picked 18 the day that bone growth stopped as the time when you want to get this kid into boot camp. You want to get this kid trained and give them optimal chance at a, at a functional life. So um, the day that bone growth stops becomes a very important factor. And if you continue to get longer, wider, and flatter as you get beyond 18 when bone growth stops, that's adult tie beam fault, and that's going to lead to problems. So from zero to 18, there's juvenile tie beam. 18 and up, there's adult. It's a weak tie beam and muscle engines precluded or, or predicted by biomechanical pathology. Good spelling there. Overuse syndromes, life, functional life expectancy reduction, and foot and postural deformities are the sequela. Okay. We need foot props and surgery. In my world, an orthotic is, a, is an entity that is a, is a prop designed to be removed once I can train that person to be strong enough to function on their own. We, we obviously don't often succeed, although I do with kids and I do with active people, but our desire, the old orthotic was something like eyeglasses that you go to sleep and take your eyeglasses off, you wake up the morning after, you still can't see, and you put your eyeglasses back on. That was an orthotic, and what I'm thinking about is LASIK for the feet.